Welcome to the Consulting Specifying Engineer webcast, HVAC Cooling Systems. I'm your moderator, Jack Smith, with Consulting Specifying Engineer and CFE Media. Jason A. Atkinson is Project Manager at Affiliated Engineers. His career track includes positions of increasing responsibility, such as organizational management and development of technical staff, detailed project planning, design of HVAC plumbing and fire protection systems, project management, and leadership. Jason, Jason has specific expertise in hydronic systems, district energy systems, energy efficiency, and sustainable design. He has provided these skills on education, healthcare, government, commercial, and industrial facility projects, and he received his Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering and Energy Processes from Southern Illinois University. Thank you both for joining us today. And Rodney, you are our first speaker. The floor is all yours. Oh, thanks. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. My phone was muted. That was uh, warned and it happened. So let me get started. Um, but hey, thanks again for having me. And, and uh, the, the presentation that we've got for you today is divided up into two parts. I've got the first part. Jason's going to do a second part that talks about the inside of the build or systems on the inside of the building. I'm going to spend time talking about chilled water production and central plant ideas um, outside the building. So I've sort of arranged my remarks in, in two parts. Part one here um, on the screen you can see we're going to talk about some high level uh, central plant design considerations. We're going to consider site and source energy and, uh, um, and then kind of describe what that is if, you have, if you're not familiar with that concept. Um, I've got some energy code things along the way, and then we'll use a case study as an example to show kind of uh, kind of the remarks that I've got and how uh, how these things kind of come together. The second part of the presentation is going to talk specifically about um, electric demand control um, and and how the central plants can sort of affect and really do affect that idea. Um, we'll talk more again, more about how the energy codes relate to the to that idea, um, and then we'll sort of connect the ideas of of this flexible fuel central plant, and uh, um, and then how that how that combined with ideas and conservation with demand really sort of pull the whole thing together. So let's get started. Um, part one of the HVAC cooling systems. Again, we're going to talk about high level central plant design. So this isn't a conversation to talk about the next uh, you know polished Fetzer valve and how it'll squeeze another ounce of uh, efficiency off the uh, off the system. This is more of just kind of a schematic design setup and how you, you know, some ideas on how to select different equipment. Um, we'll show how fuel sources um, really do affect um, flexibility and operation, operational savings. Um, again, the idea is to, uh, to optimize this notion called source energy. And then um, I got electric demand ch um, charges there. We'll spend a little bit of time in part one, but that's really mostly part of the, the second part of my remarks and my discussion. So. Um, let me go to the next slide. So you'll notice right away on this slide that it violates uh, the number one uh, the number one rule when you put presentations together. There's too many words on it. But essentially, what we've got here in front of you is is uh, the two definitions from the Energy Star website on site site and sort source energy. Generally, when we talk about energy reduction or energy of any sort, um, usually we're talking about the site energy. That's the, that's the amount of energy consumed that turns up on your utility bills. That's the meter. That's what you generally see. Um, there's another notion called source energy that is the amount of energy it takes to generate um, that site energy, including all the losses um, between wherever it's generated and wherever it's used. Um, and this whole notion um, is really starting, I believe, is starting to gain traction and, and really is the really kind of the, one of the foundations behind um, new concepts like microgrid and on-site power generation that we're starting to see more and more in the built environment. Um, so I, again, read those de read those definitions. There's a re there's a link there to take you to even more information on some of the uh, on on how this is defined. So let me click to this slide, and you can see the numbers on on how those definitions really work. And and I've picked our two most common. Um, energy sources that we that we generally use in all of our buildings. I'm sure there are plenty of others that are out there, but generally all of us are working in with designs and working in buildings that either use or use a combination of natural gas and and or electricity. 
And so you can see um, on natural gas, its source to, or site to source energy ratio is very low, almost one. Um, you know, very little losses from when the when the gas from gas transmission from wherever it comes out of the wellhead to when you use it at the site. Electric, on the other hand, is is quite a bit bigger, more than three to one. And uh, and you know, you can sort of get your brain around that's that has to do with trans transformer losses, losses in production, and uh, you know things like that as it's as the as the power from the power plant is finally making it all the way to the outlet in, in your building. So to kind of get started on the case study, and we'll evolve and 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 really touch on a lot of the other topics, but I want to tee the case study up first, so then you can get a kind of idea of the context of what we're going to talk about. We're going to use a real simple a real simple building, you know, a, a K-12 facility, um, and I picked weather data in Kansas City because that's where I'm talking to, you for, talking to you from today. And I want to look at three different, sort of three different chiller options. Um, two of them are very common. I think that we're all used to seeing in these types of environments an air-cooled chiller and a water-cooled chiller. And then just for fun, I threw in a gas-fired chiller in there, which you see in the U.S. Um, every now and then, but certainly not as common as the other two, as the other two chiller types. Um, we're going to use as our, our fuels. We're going to use electricity and, and natural gas, um, and so this is what we're going to sort of base all of our kind of context and all of our conversation on for the next couple of minutes. All right. So because the picture is worth a thousand words, I put together a couple of real simple schematics here to kind of make sure that we're all understanding what we're talking about. And so option number one in this little example is the gas-fired chiller option, and we know that gas-fired chillers use a little electricity, but generally. In this example, we're going to talk about one that's, that's primarily using gas, um, and it's a water-cooled gas-fired chiller, so we've got a condenser pump, and we've got a cooling tower, and then we've got a chilled water pump. So that gives you an idea of what we're talking about with that example. Um, option two is just a simple air-cooled chiller, and it's, it's, uh, you know, it's got um, electric driving the chiller, of course. We've got a pump on it with a drive, and, uh, and a real simple, real simple layout. And then option three is the uh, water cool chiller. In this case, it's going to be a centrifugal chiller. It's uh, it's got a cooling tower. It's got a pump similar to the gas fired chiller, and then it's got the the chilled water pump similar to um, similar to the chilled water side. Shouldn't be anything unusual for anybody. Those all three of these options are were picked on purpose to just give us a context to talk about some other ideas. All right. So um, now we've got an idea of the different systems we're talking about. Let's um, Break into the or, or talk about and sort of summarize the different energy efficient the efficiency requirements that are that are part of uh, part of the codes and part of the standards that we generally deal with every day. Um, we picked for this example. I just went ahead and picked the International Energy Conservation Code, California Energy Conservation Code, and then the ASHRAE standard 90.1 that uh, that tends to sort of drive all these codes. And and then there are plenty of others out there. You know, ASHRAE has several other standards that are. That are out there. Um, 189 is one. Um, I know that many of you work in different parts of the country that have um, specific standards for different building types, schools, or hospitals, or data centers, and stuff like that. So we we know there are others. It's probably a, an exhaustive list that we could do just one of these webinars on alone if we wanted to. Um, but let's get let's get to it. What I'd like to talk about here is just real quickly. You can see this is the prescriptive approach, um, a table for the efficiency, the minimum efficiency levels. For the prescriptive approach of the uh, of, a, of an energy uh, of the energy efficiency requirements, and just real quick, I don't want to I don't want to bore you with all the different numbers here, but let's let's just focus on the centrifugal chiller, um, and then we'll pick. What I'd like to do is pick um, you know option path B there. In the prescriptive approach, they give you a path A and a path B, um, and you can you can see the numbers there. The kW per ton is the uh, is the is the is the max efficiency number. And then IPLV is, of course, uh, the part load condition. Um, and so, with the interesting, a couple of interesting things about this, you can kind of see the comparison between the different devices. But then you can also see the column in the middle is is the 2010 ASHRAE 90.1 and all the other those other codes that are listed that you can see. And then you can see the the table of the column on the right how the those efficiency requirements are changing and getting a little bit more a um, little bit more strict and a little bit more stringent. We've all Notice that as, as we've been designing buildings over the years. So let me click to the next slide. And so, as part of these compliance paths that are required for the energy codes, and generally they're all they all have sort of the same the same sort of idea. 
Um, there's uh, some variation between the different different codes and standards, but usually there are multiple paths. Um, the two biggest and most common ones would be the performance path where you have trade-offs and you're doing an analysis through a simulation model, or, a, uh, or the prescriptive, which is the table that I just showed you on the previous slide that pretty much requires you to hit um, certain minimums and do certain things as part of your design. They really define what your design looks at. All these efficiencies are based on standard test conditions. Generally, the efficiency numbers have a full and a part load requirement that must be achieved. And then again, I wanted to mention here also something that, that you should be aware of um, as you use these codes. Generally, they give you a path A and a path B, and uh, there's no mixing and matching of those numbers. They usually, you have to pick one. And generally, the path A um, has, a, has a stricter, has a stricter um, part load, or a stricter full load and a little bit less part load. And the path B has a, a strict or a less restrictive full load, and uh, and a more restrictive part load. Try spitting that out on the phone ten times. Okay, let's move on. And so here are the results um, from the simulation that we did. So we just did just a real simple, quick simulation, and all the results on this slide are based on the prescriptive IECC um, values. That are that are in the tables that we showed you before, and a real and, and really what what I want to point out in this slide is is not so much the uh, um, I, what I want to point out on this slide is just a couple of things. Um, the first thing I want to m mention is the site energy number there. That's the annual amount in in MMBTUs per year is what that is what that column is about. And then the the slide or the column right next to it, that gas to electricity ratio, that's to really give you a sense of of how much electricity to how much gas energy part. Is, is part of that particular system. And you can see, the, as you might expect, the gas is almost the same amount of gas is used as, a, as electricity in this example. Um, the air-cooled and water-cooled have the values right there. And then the, the comparison using, ba using the lowest energy user in this analysis, which turned out to be the, the water-cooled centrifugal, which seems to make sense. You know, those numbers are fairly consistent with typically what the, the simulations that we run. Air-cooled was, uh, was right there next to it. And then when you're just looking at site energy and the, uh, and the amount of energy used to the site, you can see the gas has quite a bit more energy consumption in this example. If I click to the next slide, you can see the, uh, um, the performance comparison when we look at the source energy per year. And this is the thing that I really want to point out, and this is kind of the important slide that as part of this notion of optimizing the site energy is you can see when we just look at this, or optimizing the source energy, excuse me, when we look at the source energy, you can see the gas all of a sudden now becomes much closer and much more competitive in the overall, uh, um, in, in, in comparison to the other two examples. And we think that's a, that's a really important thing when you're, when you're thinking about doing an ENERGY STAR building or, or you're really concerned about you know, it's kind of the, the overall environmental impact of the, of the energy that you use, not necessarily the energy at the site, but the energy from the raw material, um, and when you connect, make that connection to the uh, to the source energy, it really it really starts to make this this uh, notion, this idea, important. Okay, so let me uh, let me get to the you know the kind of the conclusion of this part of the of the case study. Um, you know, the source energy creates a little bit different perspective when you start keeping that when you use that as sort of a measuring stick for comparing different options. You can see the the fuels with with uh, low site to source ratios, improve your energy star scores. That's how energy star evaluates your scores and gives you a score is based on source energy, not on site energy. So if you're doing projects that have a focus on, on high energy star scores, it's something to keep in mind. And then these fuel tariffs um, and, and fuel costs really suggest that a different point of view and, and some flexibility in the type of fuels you use in your, uh, in your central plant are important. Okay, let's go into part two. And part two is really focusing on demand control strategies. And uh, there's a definition there right below about what demand control is for those of you that don't know what it is. But electric demand is, a, is something that utilities use to uh, and measure the, the sort of the point in time of the amount of energy power you're using at any given time. And this is electric demand is, is, a, is, a, is electric driven. It's generally measured in kilowatts. Okay, so let's break this down a little bit on how it over how it affects the, the operating cost of of the of a building. And so those four topics there are really the kind of the main ideas that, that show up on a utility bill for a facility every year. Things like service charges and taxes and fees, 
those are things that really are fixed and that we don't have any control over. Um, that's just part of doing business. The things that uh, engineers and us energy guys focus on are things like the cost of energy or the amount of consumption would be that second column, and then demand charges. And the, uh, well, a lot of times we're just talking about the cost of energy or trying to make the building more efficient. And we're really only, uh, when, when we're focusing just on the cost of energy or just on the amount of energy used, we're only talking about half of the equation. It turns out that in a lot of facilities, you know, for those of you that have done the math and done some energy benchmarking, you'll realize or recognize that half, a lot of times half or nearly half of your total utility costs for electricity tend to be tied up in demand charges, not necessarily in the cost of energy. And so it's something to, as you're, as you're evaluating your designs and as you're looking at, thing, looking at how buildings perform and, and how you can improve the performance, not only should be you considering you know, energy efficiency measures that have to do with operating costs, but also how they affect demand charges. So let's talk a little bit and dig into what, how demand can be affected. Um, and so I've got just four things there listed on this slide that really sort of talk about demand and, and what you need to look for if you're going to consider some sort of demand control strategy or, uh, or trying to defer operation of equipment, um, which is primarily what that first one is, the cost of energy changes during the day. If your value or your utility tariffs are set up such that you get better rates it's not necessarily demand control, but it's certainly an operational mindset of how you run your plant. You know, as the demand charges and demand charges during the day vary in the amount of those charges, those are things that really trigger you to start thinking about demand control strategies. And then another notion there is, is system performance improvements may vary during the day. In particular climates, you have wet bulbs and dry bulb temperatures that will really affect the efficiency of your chilled water production equipment. And so understanding how those, affect, how those might affect and trying to defer the operation of the equipment to maximize that performance not only helps in the energy consumption part, but will also help in your, in your demand charge. OK, next slide. Let's talk about how the energy code and how the energy standards sort of mix into it. And I want to apologize in advance. I said energy code, and then I'm going to use ASHRAE 90.1, which in most parts of the world is an energy standard. Not, and it only uh, it informs the energy code. But I'm going to list, I got a list here of the, in the prescriptive path for 90.1, I've got a list of things here that are, that are really sort of reflective in, in a chilled water plant as part of the code and things that you have to pay attention to when you're designing these systems is, you know, there are variable system flows, flow reduction through off equipment. Um, and in the 2013 version, that language has changed to isolation. They have chilled water reset temperature requirements. Water side economizers are required as part of the prescription, prescriptive approach for water-cooled equipment. Um, the next list of things here is fan speed control and heat rejection equipment. So that's, the, that's controlling the fan on a cooling tower, for instance. Um, minimum pipe size limitations is also referenced in the code, so you don't undersize your pipe and, and, uh, and use too much pump energy. Hydronic balancing. And then there's a, uh, there's a little bit of language there, and the, even the 2010 about, about commissioning or commissioning light, as I like to refer to it. So let's go to the next slide here, and it's, this is um, just some simple ideas on cooling systems, and really I, I rank these from easy to evaluation. And these are things that aren't necessarily in, that aren't in the prescriptive part of the code, but are things that you can use and do and strategies you can consider as part, of your, uh, um, as, as part of your design layout. So condenser water reset temperatures, pump pressure control resets. I've got thermal and ice storage listed there, and those might be considered similar topics. Um, depending on your thermal energy storage, um, really they might be separate. That's, that, that's arguable. And then multiple fuel sources, which is kind of what we were talking about in part one, where you consider um, maybe, a ga maybe part gas, part electric as part of your chiller design. Okay, so how does this performance work out? And again, same sort of idea as what we talked about in part one there, part one before. And this is just the, how the demand works out. And you can see right away that um, the gas-fired chiller, as you might expect, has a much lower demand charge compared, or demand, electric demand predicted compared to the air-cooled or the, or the water-cooled options, quite significant as a matter of fact. And so as you, as you do your homework and, and run your costs, for your specific utility rates and tariffs as, your, as part of your design project, it's not just the energy, it's the cost of the energy, and it's how the demand sort of works that really, um, that really adds up to all, the, all the, the final analysis. So let me connect the dots here and, and wrap things up real quickly. Um, if your desire is to you know, reduce energy costs, minimize the source energy, have fuel flexible 
and electric demand avoidance are all sort of desires that we've talked about today. Then some considerations as you're laying out your chiller plant are you know, multiple fuel sources. Maybe you've got some gas-fired chillers and electric chillers working together to, to really attack that demand. Um, demand control sequences, not only in how you select the equipment, but how you operate the equipment are terribly important. And then thermal, thermal storage and ice storage are, are two topics that have been used over the years, um, really in, in larger plants, but I think we're starting to see them on even smaller scale now um, as a means of, of addressing demand control. And then to wrap it up, um, you know some things that we're advocating. Consider source energy optimization as you're as you're as you're designing your plants. Include demand control strategies. Energy source impacting demand and operating costs. Um, two topics at the end that I think are, are probably the most important of all of these that we haven't spent much time on today, but the notion of human impact on on performance. And that's not only training your facilities people to operate these things, but when you're starting to use demand performance and affecting um, how the building operates and the occupants can notice, they certainly need to be informed and trained on how to operate some of the, some of the smaller things as they're living in there. And then finally, the last thing I want to talk about is just evaluate the results. Don't be afraid to, to just do these systems and then walk away. You need to own these buildings forever. And, uh, and make sure that they perform the way you designed them and, and take advantage of the successes that you can create. So with that, I want to wrap up my remarks and, and uh, turn it over to Jason, and he's going to go inside the building. Thanks, Rod. So Rod has uh, spent a little bit of time uh, talking about the production of chilled water and our various options, and, and I'm going to go inside the building, and we're going we're to look inside the building at the various uh, options and technologies that exist. So. What we want to do is really look at uh, what typical options or, or op technologies are available to deal with the space or terminal level uh, cooling needs of a building, uh, the kinds of applications that each of those systems can, can be utilized for or not utilized for, and then really look at the different benefits and limitations for each of those systems or specific technologies. So at the space or terminal level, there's, there's, there's a myriad of op options that are available. So we kind of try to break them down in a few categories, and the, the first category being um, all air systems. And there's really two types of all air systems that we look at. We have uh, systems that are uh, typically dilution ventilation, which is a typical VAV system, or an underfloor displacement or underfloor or displacement ventilation. We're going to talk about those. Um, hybrid systems, uh, we're going to talk a little, touch a little bit about hybrid systems, which are a hybrid of a couple different technologies, uh, utilizing some form of radiant or chilled beams. Um, local options uh, are unitary options where, where we have equipment local um, to, the, to the specific space. Uh, we're going to look at heat pumps, specifically air to water type, and then we're going to talk about variable refrigerant flow. So these are just a few of the, of the many technologies that are available at a space or terminal level. Um, as the designer, it, it's really your, uh, your job to evaluate that technology and, uh, or combination of technologies even perhaps and figure out which one works for your specific building or your specific application. So again, um, there's lots of standards that kind of help uh, dictate uh, how, these are, how these technologies are used. Uh, we have a, several of the uh, ASHRAE standards, um, whatever version might be applicable for, for where you are in the country. Um, between the energy code itself, 90.1, 189, as Rob mentioned, the high performance green building standard. Um, obviously, when we're talking about space levels as well, we need to be concerned with uh, 60, ASHRAE 62.1 for air quality and ASHRAE 55, which is uh, in basically thermal comfort. Uh, and then we have the uh, typical International Code Council versions between the Mechanical Code and the Energy Conservation Code, specifically uh, California Title 24 uh, has its own specific requirements that need to be to need to be met. So we're going to start out with all air systems, and we're going to start with an with an overhead or a mixing uh, diluted type uh, air system, where this is what we typically see in most of our buildings, and everyone's much more familiar with. And I kind of get a graphic on the right to represent that. Um, you know, it's where we introduced air from a central air handling unit or, of, or piece of equipment um, that basically uh, in, in puts the air into the room. We, we exit at a high velocity from either a diffuser in the ceiling or high on a wall. And that, the, that velocity coming out of the diffuser helps to create mixing. Uh, Kawanda is a specific uh, terminology for it. They create the Kawanda effect that actually tries to stir up and mix that space. Um, because we're mixing the space, these systems are obviously called mixed, mixed uh, mixing or dilution. The, the space is essentially 
considered to be fully mixed, meaning that we have very small temper, temperature differ, uh, variations throughout the space from, a, you know, from the floor to the ceiling uh, throughout the room. The temperature variations are very small. Um, the same is true for any contaminants that are in the room because we're stirring up and mixing uh, those contaminants get moved uh, around as well. So, you know, Air distribution systems that are most commonly used with an overhead system would be typically potentially a constant air volume system, but for very air volume systems, um, we have a single duct, a dual duct, fan powered systems, whether they be series or they be parallel. Those are all options to use to help control and deliver air into a particular space using an overhead air system. So a couple of uh, advantage or applications we want to look at specifically for this is that the, this system is very common. I mean, where can it be applied? Well, you know, we can apply an all-air overhead system in nearly any building and in, in any application. Um, we utilize the variable air volume terminals I mentioned to um, modulate dampers to allow more or less uh, air into the space uh, to help meet the need, you know, help meet the uh, the load that we're seeing. Now there are some specific requirements regarding the control and the uh, the design of a variable air volume system specifically within ASHRAE 90.1, and I kind of got right there. It's in section 6.5.3. Gives you some specifics regarding control, especially if you're using the control to uh, with with reheating coils and using it for both both heating and cooling in different ways. You've got to be careful of the, uh, the uh, specifics of that, that part of the standard. So another type of all-air system is UFAD, which is underfloor air distribution or a displacement ventilation system. And again, I got a graphic on the right to help try to explain uh, how this system works. Um, we, instead of coming from the ceiling, we have air either at a low, uh, a low level, as shown in this graphic, or, or under the floor. Cool air is, exits at a very low velocity this time, rather than a high velocity, and it comes in at the floor. The natural buoyancy of the air, because of its temperature, tends to pool along the floor. So you, it, it can come into a room and kind of find its way around the floor at a, at a, at a given elevation. Uh, individuals, people in the room, heat sources in the room, all of those things are going to create a thermal plume. And those, the, the thermal that's given off by those individuals pulls, those, pulls the air to those heat sources and actually pulls it up into the occupied zone where the people are, where the air needs to go for, for the cooling effect. As a result of this, you'll see uh, kind of through the color part of the graphic that, that with a displacement or an underfloor air distribution system, this, within the space, the, it's very stratified. The, there's very large temperature variations between potentially in the low 60s, mid 60s at the low level, up to you know in the 70s above head level, and even even higher uh, when we get up into the ceiling space or the high ceiling space. So there's there's a very big um, temperature variation. The, the other thing, and one of the benefits of of a displacement ventilation is is a very it's very non-uniform from a contaminant concentration as well. So we're not mixing the air, we're not stirring it up, so the contaminants are localized as well and, and not mixed in the space. Um, for these systems, obviously we're using cool, uh, cool air, but not as cool as the overhead systems. You know, we're using a warmer supply air temperature, somewhere between 63 and 68 Fahrenheit. And as we noted, it's typically distributed either low wall or under the floor. A uh, common solution for the uh, large spaces or large open office spaces, libraries, um, any place where you got a lot of big open areas, uh, potentially with high ceilings as well, is a great solution for displacement. Um, you know, theaters, lecture halls, casinos, I've kind of got a, a theater shown there in the, in the graphic where we distribute air kind of below at a low level and it's, it's captured at the top. Those are great applications for uh, a displacement system as well as industrials, casinos, any big open spaces. So many of these applications allow for local adjustment at a, at a diffuser at the, at the individual's feet or, or, or low to the ground to help maintain their own personal uh, occupant comfort, which is also very helpful. And another great thing about displacement or underfloor is it's, it's very easy to use with other technologies to meet your cooling demand. So I'm not going to go through all of these. Again, a lot of words on a slide here, but uh, there's various different uh, limitations and or benefits for each system. In this instance, the overhead mixing dilution type systems, there are some limitations. Um, from an energy efficiency, it is, it is more energy intensive than a displacement system. We've got, uh, a more, we've got duct work that is uh, operating at a higher pressure, so we have higher fan energy. We're utilizing lower temperature air, so therefore we have an increase in cooling energy. <clears throat> also, because we're mixing the space, we in some ways are, are paying a penalty uh, when we talk about the ventilation efficiency within the space and thus often need to bring in more air uh, to accommodate that, which is kind of referenced in ASHRAE 62.1. 
Um, part of the thing is, part of, part, some good things are is it doesn't impact the programmatic space in the room. It's Everything's hidden above the ceiling. There's very little maintenance because there's obviously very few moving parts in any of those pieces of equipment. So displacement. Um, one great thing about displacement ventilation is it's very flexible. Uh, it can compensate for you know changes in load within the space without necessarily having to relocate the outlets, because we're getting the air to the occupants uh, directly into their breathing zones much at a much uh, more efficient way. Um, ASHRAE 62.1 and within the table we actually get a 20% um, credit on the amount of ventilation that we have to provide because we're getting it there. A lot lower pressure drop, um, we're using warmer air, so a lot of things that come into energy efficiency, reducing reduced fan energy, reduced cooling energy. Um, the building impact, however, though, is in you often have to create a raised floor, which has some cost, or it actually eats up a little bit of the programmatic space to get ducts down low to actually deliver the, deliver the air at a low level. Very low noise, however, and essentially no equipment uh, or anything that needs to be maintained. So moving away from air, all air systems, we want to chat a little bit about hybrid systems. So a hybrid system basically utilizes both air and a hydronic or water solution uh, uh, system to, for, as a solution to satisfy the needs within the space. The great thing about hybrid systems is it allows us, and you'll hear this many times, it allows us to essentially decouple the sensible cooling loads, which are the load heat gains from people, from equipment, from lighting that's directly in the space, from latent loads that also people generate, and the ventilation load, which is, which is very heavy oftentimes, depending on your climate, um, in, in latent uh, cooling energy that's required to deal with. So a hybrid system utilizes air, and we often refer to these as dedicated outside air systems. We use the dedicated outside air system to provide the ventilation air directly into the space and to deal with any latent cooling, both within the space and with any ventilation air that's coming out. To deal with the sensible loads local to the space, we use the, some type of hydronic solution. In this instance, it could be a radiant solution, which could be either a radiant floor, or a radiant ceiling, or a chilled beam, whether it be passive or active. And the graphic you'll see there as well, in this instance, I mentioned we could couple displacement ventilation with a lot of other technologies. This is a, a strategy where you could couple a dedicated outside air system to an underfloor system to deliver ventilation to the space, and then allow a passive chilled beam to deal with the localized sensible cooling needs. So radiant cooling has been very popular in Europe for decades, uh, gained a lot of traction within the, U in the U.S. over the, the last, um, last decade and even a little further on. Um, space is cooled completely by radiation, by, by radiation meaning the, the cool, the, the slab, the radiant slab or the radiant panel essentially is absorbing any of the heat that's generated in the space. Um, one thing of note is, is that radiant cooling is often thought of for dry climates, and that's not really true. We, can, we should be able to utilize a radiant system in almost any climate. Condensation control is absolutely necessary and going to be required to do that, but if we can maintain the surface temperature of whether it be the slab or on a radiant panel, if a few degrees, two to three degrees Fahrenheit above the actual dew point in the space, we should have no issues with condensation. One benefit to these systems from an efficiency standpoint is we're using high temp chilled water or warmer chilled water essentially than a traditional chilled water system. So we, we need water anywhere between 55 to 63 degrees um, to uh, use these systems. A lot of times we're able to utilize return water from other air handling unit coils and, and utilize it to as uh, supply water to these pieces of equipment and then before it goes back to the chiller and then even enhancing that chiller's efficiency. One great thing about radiant uh, solutions, especially from a cooling, is, is it helps address a critical thermal and comfort component, which is identified in, in ASHRAE uh, Standard 55, that the other systems, that almost every other system we talk about, is unable to really deal with, and that's the mean radiant temperature. And that's, that's not something I'm going to be able to go in into detail. It's a very complex um, uh, thing within that code to understand, but it basically allows uh, the mean radiant temperature in the space allows the occupant to feel comfortable at higher space temperatures because of their proximity to where the load is being, where the heat is being absorbed. So I've got a couple graphics on there just quickly to show the difference between a radiant floor, a radiant panel, and what those two systems might look like. Um, so where can we use these? So radiant floors or radiant cooling, and specifically the radiant floor piece of that, is an extremely um, great application for a large volume space with a high direct solar load. So if you have a lobby, like is shown in the graphic to the right, with an extreme amount of windows and a very high volume of space, 
a radiant floor, a radiant cooling floor, can actually help to absorb a lot of the heat gain that's coming off of that solar and do it very effectively without having to move an ex exorbitant amount of air to do so. Radiant ceilings, on the other hand, um, they're pretty much applicable in any space as long as you can maintain condensation control. You don't have a lot of uh, you don't have a lot of connectivity to, to a non-controlled uh, space, such as directly to the outdoors. Radiant ceilings can can absolutely be used in your normal office space, classrooms, those types of things. Anywhere we have a high sensible load that you need to manage. So another time, type of hybrid systems would be coupling a dedicated outside air system with, uh, with a chilled beam. So, um, you know, chilled beams, rather than using pure radiation to deal with the sensible loads in the space, they actually use convection. So we basically are allowing convection in the lower right as, a passive, or as, as an active chilled beam, and we're, in, we're basically providing primary air from a dedicated outside air system into the beam, and using nozzles within that particular device, we're inducing some air uh, to come back into the beam, as you see with the yellow arrows, it mixes with the primary air and comes out in the green arrow to help provide more air to the space while it's passing through a sensible coil. So that's, a, that's an active chilled beam, and we have a passive chilled beam uh, shown above that, but it's using the natural t temperature variations and induction to help provide the sensible for the space. Um, chilled beams are not just for dry climates, just like radiant cooling and heating systems. They're, you can manage those spaces. Uh, they they can be put anywhere as long as you can manage the condensation. Again, like the radiant cooling opportunity, you are using warmer chilled water than the traditional system, usually somewhere in the neighborhood of 58 degrees and a very low delta T, often between 5 and 8 degrees Fahrenheit. So where can we use chilled beams? Well, we can use chilled beams in a lot of spaces. Um, like I said, it's not just for dry climates. It's ideal for any type of space that has a high sensible load. Um, it, common applications where we see chilled beams used and we've used successfully, obviously, are laboratories where you have high equipment gain. Uh, hospital patient rooms, in fact, are, are catching a lot of uh, popularity with the use of induction or with the use of chilled beams and the induced airflow, as you can see in the graphic to the bottom, as, a, as an opportunity for, for, pa for uh, active chilled beams. And then, of course, offices. If you have offices in a space where you're already using a dedicated outside air system or a 100% outside air system, such as in a lab building, you can easily utilize chilled beams within an office environment to help provide those sensible loads and, and still not have to worry about the energy penalty of using 100% outside air when you've coupled with the rest of the system. So benefits and limitations, we're going to talk about hybrids in, a, in general, uh, not necessarily either one of those technologies, whether it's radiant or chilled beams. Um, they they're, have very limited flexibility. We can't really move things around unless we're moving actual components. Uh, they, however, they use 100% outside air, so the air quality, you're guaranteed to get the amount of ventilation air to the space that you need. Very energy efficiency. Water has an extremely, uh, higher, uh, an extremely high heat transfer capacity than that of air. And a, a lot of times people like to refer that a lot of times I can move the same amount of energy in a one-inch pipe as a 21-inch uh, duct with air. So reduced fan energy, reduced cooling energy. Because we have high chilled water temperatures, we not only can help improve the chilled water efficiency, we increase the number of hours where a water side economizer might be able to be used. Um, noise, there's little to no noise, there's no moving parts, there's very little maintenance. So hybrid systems have a lot of uh, great uh, opportunities and benefits because of those reasons. And the last kind of section that we're going to talk about are local systems or unitary solutions where the primary air distribution and the cooling equipment are, are local. They're actually located in the space or adjacent to the space they serve. And we're going to only talk about a couple of these. Um, the heat pump is what, one specific item that we're going to talk about, and we're only going to talk about an air-to-water heat pump. There's, there's ground source, there's air, there's water-to-water, water, there's air-to-air, air. but in this instance, we're going to talk about an air-to-water heat pump. And heat pumps use a, a mechanical compression cycle a refrigeration system that is reversible. Um, utilize electrical power to help move thermal energy from a, seat, from a heat source to a heat sink. And in this case, from an air-to-water heat pump, we're actually rejecting any heat uh, that's created uh, to a water source. In this instance, we'll, you know, we can call this a condenser water system rather than to the air. Uh, they take uh, they, uh, heat pumps that require a compressor to do the compression part of the refrigeration cycle, and you can get those often in standard two-speed and even in, even in variable speed. 
the great thing about heat pump systems, an air water heat pump system, is that the system as a whole allows for the use of simultaneous heating and cooling. So in other words, we can have spaces in one, uh, one particular space that is utiliz utilizing its heat pump in the cooling mode, while an adjacent space can utilize it in heating mode, and we can trade off between the two. Um, it helps uh, replace a central air handling system many times. Uh, the outside air ventilation part that's required by code can be dealt with through a dedicated outside air system, or it can be uh, handled directly by a heat pump. Lots of different options uh, that are available, um, ducted, wall-mounted, ceiling recess, suspended, floor standing, almost any uh, type of arrangement you need to fit your application. The one thing that's different about the local systems that we're talking about here versus the traditional system, the other systems we've talked about, is, is that these are governed because they're actual pieces of equipment uh, by ASHRAE 90.1, and I've got some tables there identified that require minimum efficiency of those particular pieces of equipment. So common solutions for heat pumps, you see them relatively regularly in schools, offices, dormitories, hotels, motels, banks, and in lots, um, uh, lots of locations. Not necessarily a great solution for a large volume of space because they do have a limitation generally on the sizes of these pieces of equipment. The other kind of local system we want to talk about is a variable refrigerant flow system, or a VRF, which most people have heard about now. And seems to be a relatively new technology, or we think of it like that. But in fact, the, the variable refrigerant flow system was invented in Japan in 1982. So it's, it has, it's been around for over 30 years in existence. So the variable refrigerant flow is essentially a split system air conditioner or heat pump system. We use utilizing a single refrigerant circuit. So it has either one or multiple outdoor air units, or kind of the units you have to set outside of many of the homes. Which, distributes, which is distributed by a refrigerant piping to multiple zone terminal units. Um, in order for it to be considered variable refrigerant flow, it has to have at least a single compressor within the system that is variable speed, and the individual uh, terminal, or the terminal units have to be individually controlled in order to really meet that definition. Much like the heat pump, it's capable of simultaneous heating and cooling. Um, same type of scenario when it comes to dealing with ventilation direct to the unit or through a dedicated outside air system. Lots of different opportunities and arrangements for these units. And again, minimum efficiency is governed by 90.1. So common solution for VRF, got a, just a quick graphic here that shows integrating a variable refrigerant flow unit in a, in a dormitory in this instance. It's a ducted supply return directly to it. It's provided ventilate, or, uh, refrigerant from the corridor with you know, adjacent rooms next to it. This room could be in heating, and the room adjacent to it can be in cooling. So it's used in schools, offices, dorms, hotels, bank, banks, and, and lots of uh, particular applications. So benefits and limitations, again, for the local systems, a lot of, a lot of uh, energy efficiency improvement. We can eliminate some central equipment, reduce a lot of central fan energy. Multiple speed compressors help reduce the overall cooling and fan energy need as well. Um, it reduces the building uh, cost by reducing mechanical space. However, it does generally require some location, potentially within the, the programmable, programmable space itself, to locate. Um, the, the one big concern with these types of pieces of equipment are noise, because everything's located in the room or adjacent to the room. They have fans, they have compressors, things that are going to generate noise, and you need to be cognizant of that. And then finally, there's there's quite a bit more maintenance associated with these systems than, say, a, a, a radiant system, clearly just because of the presence of motors and compressors and filters that need to be maintained on a regular basis. So in summary, there's a lot of different uh, terminal or space level cooling options or technologies, and I've only touched on a few of them today, uh, given the amount of time we have. And there is really no one sit, f a size fits all solution. It really depends on your, your building, where your building's located, what kind of utilities you have available. Do I have chilled water? Uh, what kind of energy target you're looking for for your building? And, and really, how capable is your, of your maintenance staff of dealing with continuous maintenance of a local system versus something that doesn't need much maintenance at all? So in, in summary, the solution to your, to your particular project is probably somewhere in the middle. Uh, a lot of times it can be a combination of sef several of those different cooling systems, whether it be a displacement system with radiant or VRF uh, with a displacement system as well. So there's lots of different uh, opportunities in there for cooling systems to meet your need. And with that, uh, that's going to wrap up my presentation. Uh, thank you for listening, and I'm going to pass it back to Jack. Thank you, Rod and Jason, for that was a first-rate presentation. And now our presenters will answer questions about the topic. 
type your questions in the Ask Question box on your screen. And please indicate which speaker you would like to answer your question by typing his name before the question. If you're on Twitter, tweet your questions to hashtag CSEHVACCOOLING. We will get to as many questions as time allows, and additional information will be posted online at www.csemag.com with the archived version of the webcast. As a reminder, to take the Learning Unit exam and to download your AIA CES Learning Unit certificate, use the Learning Unit exam option at the top of your screen. The exam will open in a new browser window, and you can complete the exam after the webcast, but the link will break when the webcast signs off. The exam will be posted on the Consulting Specifying Engineer website at www.cesemag.com with the on-demand version of the webcast. Now let's get to your question. Rod, the first question goes to you. Considering the demand control, what are your thoughts on using steam from Cogen to run absorption machines during the day and electric machines at night? Jack, thanks. That is a, a real common um, practice on how, uh, how maybe some larger central plants um, do demand control. Uh, a couple things to keep in mind when you're considering that strategy, when you talk about energy, um, uh, understand how, uh, how efficient your steam generation is and how efficient, how efficient the absorber chiller that runs on steam is. When you compare it to just using the, the gas you're probably already using to create the steam, um, in a in a gas fired in a gas fired absorber. So those are those are a couple things to keep in mind. And then certainly when you're when you're doing your economic analysis or your life cycle analysis, the cost of the gas and the and the equipment versus the cost of the steam um, and that particular style of equipment um, matter. I think uh, a lot of times with these cogen deals, the steam is generally free or a byproduct of what uh, what the cogens really its other process might be. So um, you see, a, you probably see a lot more um, steam solutions than you do the uh, gas-fired solutions for the uh, for demand control in that in that way. Thanks. Now, Jason, you get the next one. Um, what are the benefits of using a decoupled system? So, um, kind of as I mentioned uh, during when I was talking there, the uh, the benefits of a decoupled system allow us to only to basically from a, there's a reduced construction cost clearly because we're only providing ventilation air through the uh, air system to those individual spaces versus trying to carry not only the ventilation component but the component that actually deals with the load in the space within the air system. So, a big benefit of dedicated outside air systems and decoupling um, is that you are minimizing the uh, the the, the space, one, that's required to deliver the air to a specific space, uh, to a room. And it's much more energy efficient, as we said, because if you look at the requirements of ASHRAE 62.1, you do have to take some penalties for a mixed system where you have, based on your ventilation effectiveness of, of a given room. So in a mixed air system, you do take some penalties and actually in many cases require more outside air than you would, uh, almost every case, more than you would for a dedicated outside air system where I can be very specific of what's going in. Decoupling the systems, as I mentioned, um, the amount of uh, energy that we can transport in a, in a water pipe and a hydronic solution is significantly uh, less energy intensive to transport energy than it is in an air system. And as a result of that, those systems in turn are much more efficient. If you look at the overall actual energy profile of a building and where the energy goes, a lot of it is dealing with ventilation, um, but there's a lot of fan energy and moving air around the building. Pumps are much more effective and use a lot, utilize a lot less energy to do that same transport uh, versus an all-air system. And that, that's the real benefit of decoupling them is dealing with the loads with a piped solution locally versus trying to transport it through a, an all-air system. Thanks. So, um, Rod, this question's for you. What are the pros and cons of water-cooled versus air-cooled chillers? Okay, um, well, on an air-cooled chiller, you... Uh, um, you de generally have a little bit less maintenance. You have a, you don't have a condenser water system to deal with, so you don't have those pumps. 
you don't have the water treatment that's required, um, but you, in, in return, you give up um, some efficiency. Generally, a water-cooled system, just like in the analysis that I showed today, um, is slightly more efficient at lower um, tonnages. And as you get to much larger tonnages, the, the gap between air-cooled and, and water-cooled um, grows. Um, air-cooled chillers don't tend to be as scalable as the water-cooled systems, and so you see water-cooled systems at much larger, um, much larger systems, you know, generally two, three hundred tons and up, where the air-cooled systems tend to be um, in the uh, in the more modest tons, tonnage sizes. Uh, probably the biggest difference is is efficiency and maintenance. Um, higher efficiency for the water-cooled, a little bit easier maintenance for the air-cooled. Okay, we have time for one more question. And Jason, it's yours. Where are chilled beams best applied? Oh, chilled beams best applied. Well, I, I would say that, kind of like uh, I mentioned, I don't know that there's a best uh, application for chilled beams. Um, they can kind of be applied anywhere where you can clearly control um, humidity and the dew point within the space for that condensation control, as we mentioned. Uh, you know. Office spaces are great um, if you're doing a dedicated outside air system. Um, laboratories, any place where you've got really high sensible loads that is significantly driving the amount of air required to condition the space um, well above where it really needs to be, those are great opportunities to use chilled beams. So you can look at it a couple different ways. There's, there's uh, the, you know, how much air do you need to condition the space versus the amount of ventilation that's required to ventilate the space. And if there's a big delta between the two, then chilled beams are a, a definitely viable option. One, one word of caution on chilled beams is, is that, again, because of the condensation control, I would never recommend uh, putting a chilled beam in a space where you had an operable window, um, something that could be or, or a correct, uh, con direct connectivity to the outside without a, without a vestibule or some, some type of anti-space because you don't have the ability to continually monitor or maintain um, the, the dew point in the space. If someone were to open a window, you wouldn't want to take that risk in using a chilled beam. Um, I, at least I wouldn't recommend that. But other than that, that, um, you know, we can use them in schools, office spaces, uh, laboratories are a great place if you have really high sensible driven laboratories, that's a, that's a, a perfect place for them. You know, m I would say there's no perfect application for a chilled beam. You have to be very cognizant of what, do you, what where you are, how well you can control both the dew point within the space as well as the adjacent spaces to that if there's any communicating space between them. Thanks, Jason. Good questions and great answers. I'd like to close by thanking our great speakers, Rod Othout and Jason Atkinson, for kindly sharing their time and their knowledge.